The International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia is now in session. L'audience du tribunal pénal international pour l'ex-Yugoslavie est ouverte. Please be seated. Ask the registrar to call the case, please. L'affaire numéro IT 9622A, le procureur contre Dragen Erdemovic. Thank you. May I have the appearances, please? Your Honours, please. My name is Neiman and I appear for the prosecution. Thank you. Yes, please. Just this so the Yasem Jovan Babic, Ulozi Braniotsa. Thank you. Mr. Adamovic, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Thank you. Well, let me say at the outset that uh, Judges Lee and Stephen wish to apologize through me for being unable to attend this hearing. I shall now read out a short summary of the judgment. The appellant had challenged the judgment handed down by the trial chamber number one on the 29th of November 96, sentencing him to 10 years imprisonment after he had pleaded guilty to a charge of having committed a crime against humanity in July 95, in the territory of the former Yugoslavia. The issues considered by the appeal chamber have comprised not only those raised formally by the parties, but also issues concerning the guilty plea of the appellant raised by the appeal chamber itself. By addressing three preliminary questions regarding the validity of the appellant's guilty plea to the parties, the appeal chamber ensured that the parties were given the opportunity to make submissions in relation to these additional issues. In its judgment, the appeal chamber examines the validity of the guilty plea entered by the appellant. Adopting the reasoning contained in the joint separate opinion of Judges MacDonald and Vora, the majority of the Appeals Chamber notes that the concept of the guilty plea per se is the product of the adversarial system of common law countries and justifies the existence of the guilty plea within the procedure of this international tribunal. The advantages provided by the guilty plea in minimizing costs, <coughs> saving court time, and avoiding the inconvenience of trial to many are equally applicable to trials in an international criminal tribunal. The appeal chamber sets out the following three minimum preconditions which must be satisfied before a plea of guilty can be accepted as valid. Firstly, the guilty plea must be voluntary. It must be made by an accused who is mentally fit to understand the consequences of pleading guilty and who is not affected by any threats, inducements or promises. Secondly, the guilty plea must be informed. That is, the accused must understand the nature of the charges against him and the consequences of pleading guilty to them. Thirdly and finally, the guilty plea must not be ambiguous or equivocal. It must not be accompanied by words amounting to a defense contradicting an admission of criminal responsibility. The majority of the appeal chamber, with Judge Lee dissenting, finds as follows in relation to each of 
these three preconditions. The guilty plea of the appellant was voluntary. However, the guilty plea of the appellant was not informed. The appellant did not understand the nature and consequences of pleading guilty in general, nor did he understand the nature of the charges against him and the distinction between the alternative charges. These matters were never adequately explained to the appellant by the trial chamber or by defense counsel. And as a result, the appellant elected to plead guilty to having committed a crime against humanity rather than the alternative charge of a war crime. Upon examining the distinction between these two offenses, the majority of the appeal chamber, with Judge Lee dissenting, holds that all things being equal, a punishable offense, if charged and proven as a crime against humanity, is more serious and should ordinarily entail a heavier penalty than if it were proceeded upon on the basis that it were a war crime. Rules proscribing war crimes address merely the criminal conduct of a perpetrator against an immediate protected object. Rules proscribing crimes against humanity, in contrast, address the perpetrator's conduct not only towards the immediate victim, but also towards the whole of mankind. Consequently, in electing to plead guilty to a crime against humanity instead of a war crime, the appellant pleaded guilty to the more serious offense and the one entailing a heavier penalty. As the appellant's plea was not the result of an informed choice, the appellant must be afforded the opportunity to re-plead with full knowledge of the nature of the charges, the distinction between the alternative charges and the consequences of pleading guilty to one rather than the other. The appeal chamber then addresses the question whether the plea of the appellant was equivocal. A plea is equivocal when the accused pleads guilty but persists with an explanation of his actions which in law amounts to a defense. The court is then obliged to reject the plea and to enter a plea of not guilty. In the present case, the appellant pleaded guilty but then claimed to have acted under duress. Accordingly, the question whether the appellant's plea was equivocal depends upon whether duress can afford a complete defense to a soldier charged with crimes against humanity or war crimes where the soldier has killed innocent persons. The appeal chamber finds that there is no customary international law rule on the specific issue of whether duress can be pleaded by a soldier to a charge of killing innocent persons. The majority of the appeals chamber, with Judge Cassese and Judge Stephen dissenting, finds that duress is no complete defense for a soldier charged with crimes against humanity or war crimes involving the killing of innocent human beings. In the majority, Judges MacDonald and Vora examine general principles of law recognized by civilized nations as a source of international law under Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice. They are satisfied that underlying the specific rules on duress, 
in each of the surveyed jurisdiction is the general principle that a person is less blameworthy and less deserving of the full punishment when he performs a certain prohibited act under duress. In the light of the irreconcilable inconsistency between the rules regarding duress in the legal systems of the world, Judges MacDonald and Vora adopt the settled practice of international judicial bodies of employing the general principle in order to derive a legal rule applicable to the facts of the particular case. They find that the rule is Duress is no complete defense for a soldier charged with a crime against humanity or a war crime involving the killing of innocent human beings. In reaching this conclusion, they attach great weight to the proposition that international criminal law has a normative purpose and must guide the conduct of soldiers in armed conflict in an effort to deter the commission of breaches of international humanitarian law and protect those who are vulnerable and weak in armed conflict scenarios. Judge Lee, also on the majority on this issue, finds that no general principle of law may be derived on the question whether duress can afford a complete defense for the killing of innocent human beings. Because positions of the legal systems of the world in relation to this issue are too divergent. Judge Lee accordingly examines the existing international case law and concludes that the weight of this case law supports a finding that duress is no complete defense in international law to a charge of killing innocent persons. The disposition of the judgment of the appeals chamber is therefore as follows. The appeals chamber unanimously rejects the appellant's application that the appeal chamber should acquit him. By four votes to one, it rejects the appellant's application that the appeal chamber should revise his sentence. By four votes to one, it finds that the guilty plea entered by the appellant before trial chamber one was not informed. By three votes to two, it finds that duress does not afford a complete defense to a soldier charged with a crime against humanity or and a war crime involving the killing of innocent human beings and that consequently the guilty plea entered by the appellant before trial chamber one was not equivocal. By four votes to one holds that the case must be remitted to a trial chamber other than the one which sentenced the appellant so that the appellant may have the opportunity to replead in full, full knowledge of the nature of the charges and the consequences of his plea. And finally, the appeal chamber instructs the registrar in consultation with the President of the International Tribunal to take all necessary measures for the expeditious initiation of proceedings before a trial chamber other than trial chamber one. So I have now read out the disposi disposition uh, of the judgment of our appeal chamber and I would like to turn to Mr. Ademovic. May I ask you to stand up, Mr. Ademovic? Mr. Ademovic, you, you have now heard in summary the judgment of the Appeals Chamber. The judges have deliberated for many months in this matter. 
because your situation raises issues of the greatest importance for law and morality. Let me assure you, however, that we have not ignored your obvious distress at the situation in which you find yourself. We have not lost sight of your counsel's strong avowal on your behalf at the close of the appellate hearings in May this year, when he said that not only do you not wish to endure a trial, but indeed that you feel psychologically unable to stand the rigors which such a trial might entail. Let me then make it very clear to you and to your counsel that the further resolution of this matter now lies in your hands. You have a choice before you. That choice will be made from three options, three options available to you when the matter is remitted to a trial chamber, as we have decided it should be. A new trial chamber, I should add, the composition of which has already been decided and which stands ready to hear your case with all due expedition. Your three options are as follows. One, you may change your plea of guilty to crimes against humanity for the acts you confessed to committing at Srebrenica to one of guilty to war crimes. Guilty to war crimes. In this case, the new trial chamber will not conduct a trial, but will simply proceed to sentence you, and it might decide to take into mitigation your claim to have acted only because of a threat to your life. Two, you may again enter a plea of guilty to crimes against humanity. Again, the new trial chamber will then simply proceed to sentence without conducting a trial. And again, it might take into account the duress from which you claim to have acted as a mitigating circumstance. Three, option three, you may enter a plea of not guilty, not guilty before the new trial chamber. In this case only, will there be a trial on the evidence to determine whether or not you are guilty as charged. It may be, however, and I cannot speak for the trial chamber on this matter, that such a trial could at least be based in part on the evidence you presented before the, tri the other trial chamber, which has been recorded on audio and visual tape. In any event, as a result of the decision of the majority of this appeals chamber, the fact that you were allegedly compelled by a threat to your life to act as a member of the firing squad will not in itself constitute a defense, constitute a defense leading to your acquittal. However, as in all trials before this international tribunal, you will be presumed innocent and only convicted and sentenced if the chamber is satisfied on the evidence presented of your guilt beyond reasonable doubt. Mr. Demovich, these are your choices. They may be difficult, but they are at least clear. I do not ask you to take any decision now, but to consult with your counsel and weigh the matter deeply and carefully. It will be for you to plead anew before the new trial chamber. The majority of this appeal chamber has found that on the first occasion, your plea of guilty was not informed. Our only concern now 
is that you enter an informed plea, that is, one made with an understanding by you of the nature of the charges pending against you and the consequences of your plea. We ask and expect of you and your counsel that you consider all this very carefully and that you enter an informed plea before the new trial chamber when the matter is remitted to it for its consideration. That is all. If there are any comments or statements, the hearing is adjourned. I wonder whether Mr. Demovich intends to make any statements. Da, da ja ne, jednostavno ne, ne želim, ne zbog sebe, nego zbog svoje porodice da, da dalje se raspravlja o slučaju. Ja sam rekao, fino, ako vi hoćete smanjiti, nećete smanjiti, ja ostaje deset godina i tako da ostane. Ja sam na to spreman, ja ne želim, ne vidim razloga da ja ponovo izjavljujem se o krivici i šta, šta ti ja znam ostalo. Ne želim zbog svoje porodice ponovo da se moje ime spominje na televiziji, na radiju, na... Šta ti ja znam? Samo to želim reći. Thank you. I wonder whether the council does not wish. Um, thank you, Mr. Demovic. As I said before, it is now for you to consult with your council and decide uh, how to proceed when you will uh, be brought before the new trial chamber and um, what sort of... Uh, plea uh, you should enter. And I um, tried to outline the three different options. I hope it I was clear. And depending on what, on what option you, um, you, you take, uh, the consequences will uh, follow uh, very clearly. Thank you. The hearing is adjourned. All rise.